Hey everybody, Frank Spear back with you for another episode of Watch This. Uh, today we're going to look at Matthew 25, and you know there are a lot of people out there who are very turned off uh, by the Bible uh, for a number of reasons, as you know, but one of the major reasons is this doctrine of hell, and everlasting fire, and judgment upon the wicked, and so forth. And uh, I want to kind of use this passage here in Matthew today and explain this passage the best I can and then every other passage that seems to be speaking of everlasting punishment can be explained by this one. So once we understand the interpretation of this one, uh, we can fit all of the other passages into that explanation, right? Rather than looking at every particular passage. They can all be seen in light of the interpretation that I'm about to give here. Now, many of you will already understand this, those who are watching this video, but this might be something good to share with your friends who are very turned off by the scriptures. Okay, so let's do that. Let's look at Matthew 25. And we're going to start in verse 31, and this is uh, Jesus talking about the coming judgment. Now, I'm a preterist. Most of you watching this will be preterists, meaning that we believe that the last days prophecies uh, found in the Bible all took place in the first century A.D. Uh, they came to their conclusion in 70 A.D. to be exact, when Judaism and its temple and its holy city, priesthood and that whole system was destroyed forever. It's never been back. It will never come back at least not in, the, in a scriptural way, if it ever does return in some other fashion, which I doubt. But it will not return in a way that God has anything to do with. And that was eternally destroyed. And that's the eternal judgment or destruction that the Bible is concerned with. Not people dying and going into an invisible netherworld and being burned alive, as it were, uh, forever and ever and ever and ever. The Bible knows nothing of that. Uh, it uses symbolic language that sounds very much like that, but when you understand the Bible as a whole, and you understand how it uses that language, then you'll come to see that this is talking about a destruction of a people, and of their city, and of their world, their order of things, the kingdom that they lived under. You know, take, for example, Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus is being tempted in the wilderness, and the tempter says to him, it's a, it, the scripture says that the tempter said, look out on all these kingdoms of the world here. Just bow down and worship me, and I'll give them to you. Well, what could Jesus see with his eyeballs? What were the kingdoms, the kingdom of the world there? Well, he wasn't seeing the whole world, right? Um, he was seeing Jerusalem. And he was seeing Judea and that land in Palestine. And uh, those that's the world that was being offered to him. Um, anyway, I don't want to get off track here. Let's begin reading in verse 31 of Matthew 25. But when the Son of Man, that is Jesus, comes in his glory, that's AD 70, that's the destruction of the Old Covenant system. When he comes in his glory... And all his angels with him. Now these angels, I believe, are Israelites. The word angels, it's unfortunate that they, basically this is a transliteration where the word angelos is translated as angels, very similar to the original word in its sound and its spelling. But the word means, the definition is messenger, workers. These were Israelites, and I'm going to show that as we get to the en end of this lesson today, that these were people, not supernatural creatures from heaven. So when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all of the Israelites with him, right, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Now when he's sitting on his throne, this is signifying that it's the time for judgment, right? Right? The prince will sit, or the king, will sit on his throne now to pronounce judgment. That's what's happening here, right? So it seems like he's off his throne, right? And he says, and at this time in 70 AD, 
right? He says the Son of Man will come and take his seat on the throne for judgment. It's judgment time. That's why it says, and all of the Israelites will come with him, because we'll see in the next verse, watch this, and all the nations or the peoples or the tribes will be gathered before him, that is before his throne. Now this is figurative language here. They were not in AD 70 literally gathered up into an invisible realm and taken before his throne. This is also pictured in the book of Revelation, and it's symbolism. Okay? <clears throat> All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from the other. Now, in another parable, he talks about this same judgment, but he calls he says, the sheep and the goats will be gathered before him. In another parable, he calls them wheat and tares, right? In another parable, he talks about them as, as if they're all virgins coming out to the wedding, right? So this is all symbolism here. We've got to keep that in mind, okay? Now watch this. And he does that here too. All the nations will be gathered before him. This is talking about Israel, the angels, and he will separate them one from another. So as he's sitting on his throne at the time where a judgment is going to be made, right? He will separate them one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, the righteous and the unrighteous. That's what's happening here. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left, right? The righteous and the unrighteous is a time of separation of the righteous and the unrighteous in A.D. 70. That was their final chance for those who would follow Messiah and those who would reject Messiah. Sheep and goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed of my father and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now what world is he talking about? I believe he's talking about the new covenant world that began with Jesus. And his ministry and his work. If you look at John chapter 1, it reads like Genesis chapter 1. Right? Genesis chapter 1 was the creation of an old covenant system. John chapter 1, John uses that same language to say something new is being created here. There's a new creation started with Jesus. And he says, watch John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word. We know the Word is Christ. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was with God at the beginning, and all things came into being through Him. So all things of this new covenant system. And then it goes on to talk about light and darkness, just like Genesis 1. Light are the righteous people, the sheep. Darkness are the unrighteous people, the goats. You see, it's all metaphor. It talks about Jesus coming into the world of Judaism that was living in darkness, that had apostatized towards God, and calls Jesus the light coming into the world, and that world was in darkness. It's metaphor. It's all symbolism, just like here. If we lose sight of that and we take everything literal, then Jesus was literal light, right? He wasn't uh, in the form of a human body. He wasn't a Jewish man. He was actual light. No. Light meaning truth, righteousness. And he came into darkness. Well, he came into the world of apostate Judaism. He didn't come into a black room, right? So again, it's very important. That's why I'm reiterating it here over and again, that these metaphors, the Bible is written in metaphors over and over again, in similes, in parables, in symbolism. Then the king will say to those who are on his right, Come you who are blessed of my Father and inherit the kingdom prepared from you for the foundation of the world. Now, as you read through the New Testament, you'll see that the believers in Messiah were awaiting something during that whole 40-year period <coughs> from the time that Jesus uh, resurrected to the time of his return was 40 years, representing the 40-year period that the Israelites wandered in the wilderness as they were coming out of that wilderness land into their promised land. Jesus, like a second Moses, right, was uh, the one leading Israel out from the old covenant system into the new covenant system. And it was 40 years of wandering 
in the desert, as it were, until the new kingdom arrived, till the promised land came, till the new Jerusalem of Revelation 21 came. So he says, he'll say to the sheep, inherit the kingdom. That's Revelation 21. Inherit it. Just like the Old Testament Israelites inherited the promised land, these would inherit the new kingdom, which was, Jesus said, was not a physical, material land, but it would be a kingdom that would now be within them. And the law would not be literally an external law now, but it would be a law written in their hearts. Everything would be internalized in the new kingdom. And it would no longer be dependent upon one national ethnic people for you to have relationship with God to come through them. Okay? But this would be a kingdom open to all. It was always open to all, but you had to come in by that nation and keep that law. And that was going away. So this is the time of AD 70. <coughs> Excuse me. Now he says, at that time of AD 70, the king would sit on his throne and say to the sheep on his right, it's time to inherit the kingdom. But what about the goats? What would happen to them? Well, the righteous would now enter fully into that kingdom because the old was about to be destroyed and that new kingdom would be the only kingdom of God left. So if you want a relationship with the God of the Bible, after AD 70, there was only one way in the kingdom of Messiah. Faith by faith and grace and trust in him. No longer the old covenant way. Now watch this, verse 35. And he tells them why. He says, <coughs> inherit the kingdom that was prepared for you from the foundation of this new covenant world. In other words, since it started, this kingdom has been being prepared for you. Now it's here. This is the day of judgment. It's here. Some get in, some do not get in. This is the same in every parable almost. Let me pause this while I sneeze. Okay. Some would get into the new kingdom and some would not. That's all that's going on here in parabolic form. Now he tells them why some are getting in and why some are not. And he says, because I was hungry. Me, Jesus, right? Meaning his people, his body. Right? I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. You invited me in. These are this is talking about this is talking about the 40 year period where the invitation of the gospel went out for Israelites and proselytes and converts among them from foreign nations who became part of Israel, for them to come out of the old covenant system and into the new. And he says, during that time, you guys did it right. You invited the people who were sick and you took care of them, the hungry, so forth and so on. You went out with the gospel and brought them in. <coughs> Watch this. And I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. You did good. You lived good lives. Then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or were you thirsty and we gave you something to drink? You've been gone for 40 years. When did this, when did this happen? And he says, verse uh, 40, the king will answer and say to them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did these things to one of these brothers of mine, family members, kinsmen, Israelites, to the degree that you did it to one of them, you did it to me, right? So he's saying, you went out to Israel and invited them into the new kingdom. That's what's happening here. Watch this, verse 41, but then he will say to those on his left, the goats, the unbelievers, the Israelites who would not make it into the new kingdom because they rejected Messiah. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, go away from me. As you're, you're, I'm not your king. Depart from me, right? Out of the throne room, so to speak. Out of the kingdom. This is metaphor. Depart from me, you accursed ones. You've got a curse on you. You're out of covenant fellowship with me. That's always what cur a curse meant in the Bible. And he's saying to them, because you rejected me as your king. Remember, they said, we have no king but Caesar. A pagan king who was worshipped as a god. They rejected Messiah for Caesar. He says, depart from me. You don't come into the new kingdom. You who are cursed. 
because of their idolatry, so to speak, right? Because of their Caesar worship or the rejection of Messiah. You accursed ones into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Then he goes on to say, because when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was thirsty, you didn't give me something to drink, right? You cared nothing for my people. You rejected me and my people. Now, verse 41 is where we want to focus. He will say to those on his left, depart from me out of this kingdom. You, you don't get to, not out of the kingdom, but you don't even get to come into the kingdom. I'm not your king. You who are under a curse and into the eternal fire. Throughout the scripture, eternal fire, fire speaks of judgment, of a destruction of a city, which is exactly what happened in AD 70. You go back and you read Isaiah chapter, I'll give you one example of it. Isaiah chapter 34, speaking of the Edomite city of Basra, almost 600 years before the time of Christ. This chapter is talking about that city being destroyed by fire. And look at the language it uses. Verse 8 of Isaiah 34. For the Lord has a day of vengeance for Basra, a year of recompense for the cause of Zion, because they had persecuted God's people. Zion, Jerusalem, the Jews. Ready? Now God is saying, I'm going to pay you back, Basra, for your wickedness. Watch this. Your streams will be turned into pitch, and its loose earth will be turned into brimstone, and its land will become a burning lake. It will not be quenched night or day, and the smoke will go up forever. From generation to generation, that city will become desolate, and no one will pass through it forever and ever. Well, is that fire still burning today? Forever and ever? No. This is, this is apocalyptic language for the destruction of a city. We, can, we see it all throughout the scriptures. Sodom and Gomorrah, so forth and so on. So come back now here to Matthew 25, 41. Depart from me into the eternal fire, the irreversible judgment. Remember, the king is sitting on the throne here passing judgment. Some get into the kingdom, the others don't get into the kingdom. But what did happen to the goats, the unbelievers? Their city was burned by the Romans. A million people died. It, there was a great fire. They burned to death in that city. They were slaughtered by the sword. There's other parables where Jesus says, bring the wicked servant before me and cut him in half. Referring to this war and what the Romans would do to them because all of that was, that judgment was contingent upon their rejection of their Messiah. So you're going into this eternal fire. Fire is symbolic of judgment. Fire destroys. Right? So this kingdom of Judaism, this old covenant kingdom, was to be burned and never to return. It's an eternal judgment. It's an irreversible judgment on the apostate system, the apostate world that said no to God and no to God's Son. Just like when the Bible uses the word hell, Jesus says, depart from me. In, in, there are times the Bible uses the, the, the uh, translation of the Greek word Gehenim and translates it hell, which simply means the pit or the grave. Not some nether world where people will be taken to an invisible realm and tormented by the devil and his demons for all eternity. The Bible knows nothing of that. It uses symbolic language. Now, we're going to get to the devil and his angels in a minute. So this eternal fire is talking about the war between the Jews and the Romans that took place from A.D. 66 and ended in A.D. 70. A three-year war where many were slaughtered and burned. Hell, <coughs> that, that unfortunate translation, which hell just means a pit. You know, the early English used the word hell to refer to their cellars where they put their potatoes. They said, go get the potatoes out of hell. It was a pit, symbolizing a grave. It, all Jesus is saying here is, you who rejected me are going to die. And they did. That's the eternal fire. 
the irreversible judgment that was to come upon Old Covenant apostate Judaism. And that's borne out throughout the entirety of the New Testament. Now watch this. He says, Depart from me, accursed ones, you who are, have a curse on you, into the eternal judgment, right, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. The devil and his angels are the apostate Jews. I've done videos on that. Go back and watch them. The devil is who? Part one and part two. The devil is who? Watch that, and I show it through it from many, many passages of Scripture. That the devil, the word simply means adversary, enemy, opponent. And it is used of people, human beings, all throughout the New Testament. The old as well, Satan. Revelation chapter 12 talks about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., and when those high priests, the rulers of the old covenant system, uh, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the scribes, that were all trapped in the city. Those were in the, when they died in that fire. And those who were not in the city at that time, were, were, were some of them died as well, but others were, they were all cut off from covenant with God. So the judgment applied to them too. Even if they escaped physical death, they were, there was no kingdom left for them and they were cut off from fellowship with God. Dead as it were, spiritually, covenantally. Now watch this, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. The high priest and his workers. The high priests of Israel and their workers, their ministers. This is talking about the leaders and the rulers of the old apostate system. And any Israelites that rejected Messiah and followed that system. Jesus came to say, look guys, this is ending. It's me now. I'm the resurrection and the life. If you want life with God, you've got to come follow me now. And most of them said, nah. And they killed him. They had him killed. This is the judgment that was reserved for them that happened long ago, 2,000 years ago. Right? Now, let me say something to those, I've mentioned in a bunch of my videos that angels are people. And they scoff at that. But those same people will agree that those who died in the great fire, in the great war, those who were judged in AD 70, were apostate Israelites. Here Jesus says that those who died and were destroyed and were judged in AD 70 were the devil and his angels. Many of my friends who will say that uh, angels are not people, what are you going to say about the fact that you know that it was people destroyed? Many of my uh, preterist friends will say the devil, will agree with me, that the devil and his angels were the apostate Judaizers. But when I say angels are people, they say no. That's a complete contradiction. Jesus calls those under the apostate system of Judaism the devil and his angels. Okay? Then he goes on and he says, he gives them the reason why. You rejected me, basically. Verse 42, 43, 44, 45. Now watch this. Verse 45. Then he will answer them and say, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me, these will then go away into eternal punishment. But the righteous into eternal life. Well, the righteous went into the new kingdom on earth. They went into the new Jerusalem. They went on into the new covenant relationship with God while they lived on earth and these went away into the everlasting judgment. They either died in the fire, the war, or they were cut off from covenant with God. That's what these things are talking about here. Not some, the devil and his angels, his demons with pitchforks down in some nether world where fire is burning seven times hotter than earthly fire like Dante talked about and all these levels in hell and the people are being tormented forever. No. The Bible knows nothing about that. So now when you come to these so-called hell passages or eternal destruction passages, come with this understanding and I think it'll clear a whole lot up for you. Granted, there are some difficult passages. When you come, you've got to think hard about them and see how they fit into this judgment of A.D. 70. But I guarantee you this, I promise you, they, they are all talking about the same thing and the same period of time that happened long, long ago. Thanks, guys, for your time today. 
Wait, before I go, there's one more thing I want to say. I do this often, and when I'm about to close out, I always think of something else I want to say. This is vital to understanding this uh, teaching of eternal destruction or eternal life, eternal death versus eternal life, the sheep versus the goats. The way that Israelites viewed eternal life was through their children. They lived on through their children. That's one of the reasons it was so important for them to have sons. We see this throughout the Old Testament scriptures, right? Because it would carry on the seed, right? And so the father would have a son and that son would have a son and the name would go on and on and on. When Jesus is speaking here about eternal life versus eternal destruction, he's saying that the old covenant system and the people that were a part of it would be destroyed. And therefore, their seed, in terms of being part of that covenant, would be cut off, would be ended. It would be an eternal punishment, an eternal judgment, that, that they would no longer go on as the covenant people of God which was so important to them as you read through the Old Testament, but that the people in the new kingdom would be the new sons of God, the new covenant people of God, and their kingdom would be the eternal kingdom, right? Because it's not dependent upon seed. It's not dependent upon having biological, biologically having children. It's not dependent upon that anymore and land inheritances and so forth and so on like it was for Old Covenant Israel. That's the difference between eternal death in eternal life, the eternal punishment, right? And the eternal righteousness. Not talking about hell as the way modern people view it, okay? So I hope that makes a lot of sense to you. We have to understand these things the way that the original authors and the original readers, the original understanders understood these things. And that takes a lot of time and a lot of homework. So I hope this has been helpful for you guys. Thank you.